working in this movement, in this genetically engineered education movement, um, it's so refreshing to come upon somebody who has so much scientific knowledge and experiential knowledge. Um, Howard is a farmer and um, we love, I love hearing from farmers. I used to be a farmer for 10 years, but I, I love hearing from farmers about this issue because for me it's all about seeds and it's about the earth and it's about the future of our food sovereignty and it's so exciting to me to be knowing this man who has such integrity and works with people who I've grown to know and really appreciate and who have so much integrity. Seeing scientists and farmers work at this issue and spread the word even though their reputations may be ruined and they know this before they come into it because they get attacked. Um, seeing farmers who are so busy with everything in their lives also devoting themselves to something that they feel so strongly about. So um, I, for those of you who are new to this topic, um, welcome, trial by fire. <laughs> You'll learn a whole lot tonight in a very short amount of time. Uh, it'll be a lot of information. I pray that you stay till the end of it so that you get the full experience. And um, I would like to vent, uh, welcome someone who I've called a dear friend, Howard Leaker. The objective of production agriculture is to provide an abundant supply of safe, affordable, nutritious food and other crops raised for fiber production to meet the society's needs. Agriculture is absolutely, should be, the basic infrastructure of a society. Relative to the genetic engineering, I'd like to ask a few questions, especially to the farmers that may be present in the room this evening. Have we been told the whole story relative to this technology? God, no. Do the convenience, conveniences of biotechnology for crop production come with a price? Other than some of the obvious prices that we'll show to you this evening. Are there any side effects to implementing this technology in crop production. If there are side effects, who will be responsible to pay for them? Will it be the individual that purchased the technology, the entity that collected the fee for the technology? This is a partial listing of the group of scientists that I get to work with. There's one on here that I'll only quote his research to some degree, that's Dr. Carrasco. I won't spend a lot of time about the relationships and the privileges I have with the rest of them as far as to what degree I work. And I was noticing the other day that I really need to update this. There's a whole other page that I can add to this. All of these individuals are tops in their respective fields of, of research and focusing on the challenges and the issues that are presented to this technology to this point in time. Now I'd like to really emphasize one thing. Myself and these scientists are not anti-technology. Genetic engineering can have amazing potential if and when it is utilized as it is purported to be beneficial. And you'll see that shortly. The most common crops we have in our country, as far as genetic engineering is concerned to this point in time, the first of which is a BT, or a crop containing an insecticide. BT is an abbreviation for Bacillus thuringiensis. BT, the natural version of BT, is a natural occurring soil bacterium that organic farmers have been able to use as an insecticide treatment for many, many years. If they had a specific infestation of a certain insect, they could spray this product on the crop, the insect would eat the material, it would eat a hole in their gut, they would die, it would return to the soil in a benign manner, and life goes on. The genetically engineered versions of BT that are in the corn and cotton crops in our country are vastly different than that. The natural version was used in a integrated pest management fashion. So if you need it, you put it out there. 
<coughs> Anybody involved in insect control with the use of pesticides, natural or otherwise, knows that the least amount of exposure with the pesticide that you utilize, the better off you're going to be as far as the insects being able to develop a resistance to it. The natural version of BT again returned to the soil after its job was done. The residual effects of the genetically engineered are still being researched and seeing there's adverse effects being witnessed as a result of the lingering effect of it. Every BT crop that's registered in the United States for use in production agriculture is also registered as an insecticide with the EPA. This insecticide is not on the crop like you might spray the natural version. It is in the crop. It is in literally every cell of that crop and that plant. You cannot wash it off. Herbicide tolerance. This is known as by trade name Roundup Ready and Liberty Link crops. By and far and away, the number one reason why genetically engineered crop production has been embraced all around the world where it's being utilized. The active chemical ingredient in Roundup herbicide is glyphosate. We have glyphosate resistant alfalfa, canola, corn, cotton, soybeans, and sugar beets. The active chemical ingredient in Liberty Link herbicide is glufosinate. Canola, corn, cotton, soybeans, and sugar beets are in production in our country. Now, there's, these chemicals have two things in common. They are designed to virtually kill everything they touch, except the genetically engineered crop that's designed to tolerate them. The goals of genetic engineering, and I want to emphasize this, that you remember this as we go through the presentation, these two goals, and look for the evidence of this being accomplished. Increased yields to feed the world's growing population. We know that the population growth continues in our world. We know that we need to have abundant food supply to feed all of the people. Improved nutrient contents of crops. The poster child, you might say, of this concept is the golden rice. The idea behind the golden rice was we need to enhance the vitamin A content of this rice and this will hopefully mitigate some of the blindness problems of the poor children in the third world countries. Golden rice has not been perfected as of yet, and it has not been introduced into the feed supply, or the food supply, excuse me. As far as the increased vitamin A content, yes, there is a slight increase in the vitamin A content. I believe you only need to consume about 20-some pounds per day to get your average daily allowance of vitamin A. There's also concern that it doesn't yield as well as the others. That's probably a large reason why it's not been introduced, because farmers are not looking for something that yields less. And the mothers of the children in the countries where they want to introduce this have said, we don't want our children used as experimental animals in a product like this that is <coughs> fundamentally changed and going directly into the food supply that has had no safety testing. Drop tolerance is something else they tell us we're going to see as a result of the benefits of genetic engineering. The in-plant insect protection, the objective there is reduce insecticide use, and I think everybody would agree that's a good idea. Same way with the herbicide tolerance. We were, they said we will re reduce herbicide use, and everybody would agree that's a good idea. The improved weed control and the easier weed control, by and far away, the number one reason why this technology has been embraced by farmers around the world where it's being used. So let's take a look at some of what has happened since the introduction. In 1996, the first genetically engineered crops were introduced. There was some BT corn and Roundup Ready soybeans. Roundup again, the active chemical ingredient, glyphosate. The glyphosate tolerant soybeans, the, the universities could access the conventional version of this hybrid and the glyphosate tolerant version. They were able to do side-by-side -side comparisons in replicated plots at the university level. That's the purpose and the function of our land-grant universities. 
After the second year of the research at the University of Nebraska, there was a term developed relative to the genetically engineered soybean. It was known as yield drag. There was an 8 to 10 percent less yield from the crop that was bred to tolerate the glyphosate application. This continued on. There was multi-year data and the results were consistent. It yielded less. Then as we progressed into the fifth or the sixth, maybe seventh year of the technology, we didn't hear anything about the yield drag anymore. Well, we come to find out that the university no longer had access to the seed to do the research testing. And as we started to hear issues about different insects developing resistance to some of the BT insecticidal properties, the entomologists at our land-grant universities who were not allowed to test this wrote a letter to the EPA saying mm -hmm. we cannot access this seed, there's no way we can test and prove that it's doing what it's supposed to or not. They sent that letter unanimously and anonymously, primarily because at that point in time if any researcher spoke out with a concern or a complaint about the technology, <coughs> they would be brutally attacked by the cheerleaders, you might say, of the technology and some of the companies themselves. There was also a report by the Union of Concerned Scientists published in 2009. It was entitled <coughs> Failure to Yield. They looked at all of the genetically engineered crops that had been introduced and researched in the mainstream land-grant university system before it became illegal to do so and they yielded less. The language in the technology agreement changed and says it's not legal for anybody to do research on this. After that letter went to the EPA by the entomologist, there was a little bit of a loosening up of the availability of the seed, but then there was another piece of paper that said before you can publish the results of this research, it has to be approved by us first. On our farm in northwest Iowa, in 1997, we put in our first plot. We, were, we had been putting in seed plots since 1984. We put the first seed plot on our, on our farm. It was a comparison plot. Every time the seed company would come out with their new numbers, we'd put in the old reliable and compare it to the new ones and see which one was better. So in 1997, they asked us to do this with BT. We did. We did not sign a technology agreement, and we never have and we never will. The old reliable was 2390. That was on this column. We put all of the inputs the same, all the same fertilizer, chemical, everything was the same. I'll point out to you the difference in the cost of the seed. $26.18 an acre for the conventional, $38.18 an acre for the BT. When we harvested it and they grew side by side again in the plot, we harvested the conventional at $149.91. 0.91 and the BT was 146.04, slightly less. The biggest difference was the moisture content. It was five percentage points wetter. That constituted a dock when we sold that grain. So the bottom line was we lost $57.99 an acre off our gross revenue by planting the BT corn. Now we had heard some issues and concerns in Nebraska the previous year that cattle were showing resistance to the BT corn fodder. So we thought, well, we'll do a little experiment. We took some of the 2390 corn and put it one end of the feed bunk and put some of the BT in the other end of the feed bunk, and we turned two stock cows in with that feed bunk. Stock cows and corn are kind of like kids and candy. When the dish is empty, they'll leave. The cows consumed the conventional corn, smelled the BT, and walked away from it. This was not something that we had ever experienced before. The other thing was, well, we'll give it another shot. We'll do it again next year. So we did. We did the same thing the following year, repeated it side by side in a test plot. That year, we lost $58.95 an acre on that BT version of corn. This hybrid was what we called one of our old reliables. The plant breeders did a good all-around job of really breeding it and putting it together. They had natural insect resistance and or tolerance in that hybrid. But the seed company, they saw these results kind of typical all across the area where they used it. 
didn't matter what state it was in. The sound hybrid did not perform with the VT. But there were some other hybrids that one of our customers referred to it as a corn board magnet. If they'd put the BT in that hybrid, they would see a yield increase. Well, the customer said, did the plant breeders finish their job on that hybrid or did they stop short? Well, if they did stop short and then they could do, take the shortcut with the BT and sell it for more money, which route might they take? What about herbicide use rates? In the beginning, there's no question that the glyphosate tolerant technology enabled the farmers to reduce the amount of herbicide they used. Remember, this herbicide was designed to kill virtually everything it touched. And as a result, they eliminated some of the pre-plant herbicide applications that were applied. But as the technology gained favor, more and more farmers went strictly to this mode of herbicide action and application. And they were told they didn't have to worry about weed resistance by the developer of the technology. By 2010, I know of farmers that instead of applying 32 ounces per acre of the chemical in an application, were putting on 96 ounces per acre of the chemical per application. And because of the weeds getting harder to kill, in soybeans, we were seeing some farmers putting two and three applications of that 96 ounce rate on in a single growing season. In Argentina, they also introduced the glyphosate tolerant soybeans in 1996. The, the rate was two liters per hectare. By 2010, it was 10 to 20 liters per hectare. What about insecticide use? The 2000, in 2000, Eight, Dr. Charles Benbrook looked at the overall pesticide use from 1996 to 2008 since the introduction of genetically engineered crops. He saw the same thing that I just told you that in the early days there was a reduction, but as we got further into it, that pesticide use climbed. And as it, by 2008, when he published his first study and showed that there was a significant increase over the period of time, in that 2008 year, it took 26% more pesticide to raise the genetically engineered crop than it did the conventional. This was something, however, he was not able to measure. You remember I told you that every BT hybrid, whether corn or cotton, was registered as an insecticide with the EPA, this didn't come into that figure and his analysis because he had no way to measure it. He didn't do anything wrong. The thing that we saw, and especially in our part of Iowa, we only had a need for treatment of corn board 10 to 20 percent of the time. Now the insecticide is out there every year in a growing concentration and population which laid the groundwork for resistance to set in. The other thing that happened, a, a colleague that works with the USDA Ag Research De Science Department told me, and, and he specializes in entomology, the effect of the whole cycle in the ecosystem of our bugs has been severely altered as a result of the BT. We used to have beneficial bugs, which were known yeah. as predatory. Yeah. They're no longer there because of this disruption in the cycle. Now the insects that they used to control, the farmers have to spray for every year when they never used to be an issue whatsoever. What about seed treatment? Well, we never had an insecticide seed treatment on the seed of the corn or the soybeans in the beginning. Today, you can't buy a genetically engineered corn or soybean seed without a neonicotinoid insecticide on the seed. The neonicotinoids have been banned in several of the European Union countries. Number one reason for the colony collapse disorder problem in honeybees. There was also a study that was just published that documents the fact that the neonicotinoid is causing damage to the human nervous system of the people that are exposed to it. What about the problem insects that the BT was to control? This is a picture of a corn plant. You see insects on that corn plant, and this is the ear. There's no silk 
coming out of the top of that ear because these adult rootworm beetles have eaten the silk off of there. As a result of that, there will be no kernels on there. I'll show you that the next picture will demonstrate that. This adult rootworm beetle lays the eggs for the next year's rootworm larva. The egg hatches in the soil. When the larva hatches and grows, he feeds on the roots of the corn plant. When they feed in a high enough population, the corn falls down. Again, when the beetles eat the silk off, there's no pollination, so no grain. We have Bt-resistant rootworm larva in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, Minnesota, and Illinois, all confirmed by the universities. So what's the motivation? Is it to grow more food? Is it to enhance the nutrient content of the crop? There's something known as a technology fee. This is the royalty that the company who holds the patent on the genetically engineered seed will collect on every bag of genetically engineered seed that the farmer purchases. As I said, I was in the seed business starting in 1984. I watched the steady trend of increase in seed prices. Once in a while they'd level off or even go down. But once we saw the introduction of the genetically engineered crops, it just kept going one direction. By 2010, that direction was definitely getting your attention when you were doing a projection for a break-even on your crop production. And the technology fee in those early days was separated from the cost of the seed. So I thought, I'm going to do the math on this. I'm going to take USDA's planting acres for the 2010 crop year on corn, soybeans, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and I'm going to presume that 100% of the acres in the U.S. are planted to the latest and the greatest technology and apply just the dollars of the technology fee that this would generate. Now, a number of those crops were only in the high 80s and 90 percentile range, but again, for the sake of discussion, I presumed 100% planting. On corn, we had 87.9 million acres that year. The tech fee was $60 an acre, so that would generate $5,274,000,000. million. On soybeans, the tech fee is only $24 an acre, but we had 78.9 million acres, so that generated just under $1.9 billion. On cotton, we only had 10.9 million acres at $78 an acre, so that's $850 million and change. On cotton, I had the good fortune of starting to work with cotton farmers in the southeast U.S. in the 2010 crop year. I learned a lot about cotton. One of the things that they shared with me was the change in the seed cost. In 1993, the retail price of a 50-pound bag of cotton seed was $45 to $60 a bag. By 2010, they no longer sell a 50-pound bag of cotton seed. They sell 230,000 seeds per bag, and depending on the size of the seed, that bag will weigh from 38 to 46 pounds. Here's the breakdown on the price. The seed cost is $159.99 per bag. The tech fee is $412.20 per bag, and the seed treatment, which is a combination of the insecticide, fungicide, and pneumaticide that they have to apply because if they don't, they're not going to get a stand of cotton. The main reason they're not going to get a stand of cotton is the natural attributes in the soil have been so damaged with the way the cotton crop has been raised. Every insect and every disease that might affect the crop is there to infect the crop if you don't put on the pesticide. So we're looking at a total cost of two, in 2010 of $697 a bag versus $60 a bag in 93. Continuing on. Now I want to emphasize, there were no genetically engineered sugar beets planted in the U.S. in 2010 crop year because of the court order that pulled them off, but they approved them the next year and we're back up in the 90% range again shortly after that. But for the sake of discussion, again, we presume 100% use, that would generate 96 million. Canola, we don't have that much in our country, we didn't that year, it was only 1.2 million acres at 750, so that's $9 million. So if we subtotal all these crops, not including the Roundup Ready alfalfa, which was approved in 2011 when the sugar beets were deregulated, we total up just under $8.7 billion tech fee for one year. 
I was asked to speak in Ontario, Canada about two and a half weeks ago, and I didn't want to leave them out, so I figured up the number of acres that they planted in Canada to canola in 2010 and applied the same tech fee as what we had in the U.S. That would generate $1.2 billion and change. So we have a rough estimate of $9.9 .9 billion for one year in the United States and Canada if this technology is implemented on all of the acres. What could possibly be the motivation? <laughs> <laughs> we are told, and sadly so, by people who know better, that this process of genetic engineering and the development of these crops is just an accelerated process of the genetic improvements that have been happening in nature for thousands of years. Now there's no question that there have been genetic improvements happening in crops in nature for thousands of years. But the way in which this is being implemented would never happen in nature. This is not true to be polite, and deceptive might be a better term, or stronger if you wish. So how does it work? A foreign gene is inserted or shot into the DNA of the plant, there's no control as to where it ends up. In order to accomplish all of the desired final characteristics in this plant, they will use one or all of these depending on the genetically engineered crop. First of all, a virus will be used. This virus is used as a promoter. You can have the characteristic and the trait in the plant, but you have to have a mechanism to turn it on and activate it. The cauliflower mosaic virus has been a desirable item in the virus category. In addition to having a promoter, they have to know that the infection of this characteristic is all in all of the DNA cells of this plant. For example, if you only had it in the top half or two-thirds of the plant and it was a herbicide tolerant trait, if you sprayed this herbicide on this crop now that's designed to kill everything it touches and you didn't have that characteristic in that whole plant, the top two-thirds survives the herbicide, the bottom third doesn't, it falls over. So, how do we know it's there? They develop a genetically engineered bacteria that is resistant to antibiotic. They use this as a marker mechanism to identify the full expression of this characteristic in the plant. How do they get the infection? The number one choice there is an agrobacterium. An agrobacterium, in essence, could be described as a cancer cell of the soil. Another infection mechanism that is used is a component from E. coli. If you go on the USDA's website, you will find one of the drought tolerant corns that's registered with USDA contains all of these ingredients. When they register these crops in, with the varying regulatory agencies in the different countries, they are supposed to specify and identify all such ingredients as this that they use in the development of that crop. They're also supposed to tell you with some accuracy where they're placing it in the DNA. The European Food Safety Authority analyzed 85 different genetically engineered crops and they found that 54 of them contained an unidentified and unspecified virus in 54 out of 85 times. I was given this slide by a retired molecular microbiologist from Washington State University. I was up in Washington State doing an pre education presentation similar to this one in September, and I made the comment that they had a 1 in 100,000 chance of putting that placement of this foreign characteristic into the DNA of that plant in the same spot twice. This microbiologist raised her hand, and she politely said, Howard, I would like to correct you. She said, I have done these insertions numerous times in the lab. There's no way the odds are that good that you can put it in the same spot, one in a hundred thousand. So she was kind enough to send me this slide and also this explanation. In essence, you had one in a trillion to one in a hundred trillion chance of putting it in that same spot twice. 
Why is this important? Every time there's an insertion of a foreign protein into the DNA of that plant, there's a potential development of a foreign protein in the fruit or the grain of that plant. What is the effect of this foreign protein to mammals and how many can potentially be affected? Well, if you look it up, there's 5,400 different species. So we're in this experiment with 5,399 other species. As I said, I've had the good fortune of working with family farmers from all across the country since 1992, crop and livestock. In 1998, a farmer in Nebraska, Farrow to finish hog operation, planted his first BT corn, harvested it, and put it in one grain bin by itself. First time he made feed for his sows for a breeding ration, he saw his conception rate drop 30% with the corn from this BT corn bin. He thought, well, that was just a, a fluke. That won't happen again. So he made corn out of the conventional corn bin for the next ration. Conception was in the high 90s like it was supposed to be. And farmers like to move corn out of each bin periodically so you know it's good and you keep it moving and it stays in condition. So he took some out of the BT corn again. He saw his conception rate drop 70% that second time. He called, we talked about it. I says, we don't know what's going on, but we've heard some issues. Don't use that BT corn in your conception again. We go forward another year. We go to South Dakota, we have a different operation. They have explicit computerized record keeping system on their hog production. When they had BT corn in the ration for their sows, they saw 1.6 pigs less per litter, and the weight of the piglets was lighter when they were born. We go to what? Southwest Iowa, around Harlan, Iowa. There was a gentleman that had a different BT corn. He had something called pseudo-pregnancies when he fed this corn to his sows. They went full gestation, and upon delivery, all he got was the sack of water and the afterbirth. There were no piglets present. He had the veterinary come out, they tested the grain, they blood tested the sows, they couldn't figure out the problem. University got involved, they started trying to run tests to see what they could figure out. He was a Farm Bureau member. So a reporter for the Farm Bureau spokesman came out and did a story about the problem he was having with his hogs. When that story ran with the Farm Bureau spokesman, he received phone calls from five farmers in the surrounding area that were having the exact same problem with their sows. The university was more involved. There was more vets involved. They could, tested the feed. They tested the sows. They couldn't find anything wrong with anything. But they were certain there was no way there could be a connection between the corn they were eating and this problem. Well, all the farmers realized they were all feeding the exact same BT corn hybrid to their sows. When they switched off of that BT corn hybrid, the problem went away. In our part of Iowa, when genetically engineered feedstuffs, either soybeans and corn, were in the ration, we would see illness issues in the nursery pigs. Iliitis, salmonella, bloody bowel, immune system challenges, more anemia than we ever saw before. And if these pigs that had the digestive issues, if they succumbed to the disease, the veterinary would do a post-mortem to try and figure out what we had to do to solve the problem. And it was consistent that there was irritation in the stomach and or ulcers. The immune system challenge. 70% of the cells of your immune system are located in your digestive tract. Your immune system is your first line of defense to protect you against anything foreign material that comes into your body. Now I want you to imagine that I am your immune system. You have just had supper, or dinner as you call it in town, I'm a farm boy yet, so we eat supper. And I identify a foreign protein in what's in my domain that I'm supposed to protect you. I'm identifying this wall as a foreign protein. It's my job 24-7, 365, to do everything I can to get rid of this problem in the domain I'm supposed to protect. Now I want you to imagine that you leave here now and you come back tomorrow night at this time. What will happen 
to my strength. Are autoimmune diseases increasing in our country? With the fact that we have foreign proteins from genetically engineered, genetically engineered crops in 75 to 80 percent of the processed food in the food supply. Autoimmune diseases, when the immune system attacks the body's own tissues caused by an antigen or a foreign substance triggering the production of antibodies when the foreign invader is detected. The primary symptom is inflammation. Please remember that. Now I'm going to take you, or I'm going to show you some pictures of hog stomachs. I had the opportunity and reason to take a tour of a hog slaughter plant. This plant does custom processing for niche pork market companies. I knew of several different niche market companies that took their hogs here for processing that were quote unquote drug free. They didn't feed antibiotics to their hogs for the lifetime of the hog. I also knew that those niche market drug free programs had no restrictions on feeding genetically engineered grain to their animals. And in 2008 when I took these pictures, 80 plus percent of the corn in our area was genetically engineered, 90 plus percent of the soy was genetically engineered, so it was safe to presume that these pigs that were fed this drug free were eating GMO grain. The pictures are a little graphic, nobody's ever passed out. If you're squeamish, just look at the first picture like this and you'll find out it's okay. <laughs> Dr. McGuire's the vet at the slaughter plant that helped with interpretation of the pictures. I had the good fortune of working for Dr. Newman for eight plus years when I got out of high school. I worked for him part time on and off. And Dr. Newman was semi retired from 2008. Actually, he semi retired in about 1996. But he did a lot of hog work when he was out of vet school. He's, he'll be 88 on his next birthday, still sharp as a tack. The vets that were practicing actively in hog health from 1998 to 2008, if they saw a consistency in irritation, inflammation, and, and redness in the digestive tract from 98 to 2008, and it seemed to increase, what might they call it by 2008? Normal? If they're seeing it all the time? Doc Newman could tell me what a healthy hog stomach looked like. This first one is from a non-GMO fed hog that was multi-generational. This entire herd was on non-GMO grain for five plus years. So there was no GMOs in this diet for these pigs. Notice the overall skin tone color. This yellow mucus over here, you will see that to some degree in all the stomachs because it's there as a fact that there's nothing in the system to digest. The amino acids and enzymes are still functioning, making the mucus. This is one of the drug-free, GM-fed, again presumably, overall irritation, inflammation, seen by the redness, there's a small pinpoint ulcer right there. Another. GM fed. Again, the overall irritation and inflammation is represented by the redness. This is the worst one of the drug free hog stomachs that we took pictures of. There's pinpoint ulcers here and here. All these black dots, you can see their ulcers. Over here was a full bleed ulcer at one time. There's some more down here. This is a stomach from a hog that was fed antibiotics the bulk of its life. Dr. McGuire was quick to point out to me the benefit of that antibiotic the right antibiotic would reduce that inflammation and irritation and thus the redness. But you see right dead center there is an old ulcer that has healed. This is the worst one of all of the antibiotic feds that we took pictures of. Now we were collecting or, or seeing and witnessing these issues from 1998 to 2008 and I was referring to it as circumstantial and coincidental. 
because when we had the GM feed in the ration, the problem was there. You take it away, the problem went away. You put it back, it came back. You took it away, it went away. I was working with Dr. Elaine Ingham that t at that time on our soils program. We had just initiated her concepts and we were communicating quite regularly. I told, I shared all this information with Elaine and when I said it's circumstantial and coincidental, she says, no Howard, it's anecdotal. That's the proper scientific term. Now take it to the next step, conduct the study, set up the protocol, mm -hmm. and do it scientifically. Well, I was privileged to connect with Dr. Judy Carmen, who's sitting in the back in this picture. We conducted a pig study where we took 84 pigs, same number of male and female, split them evenly, 84 in each group, took them off their mother, when they came off their mother, the first solid feed they consumed was non-GMO and GMO, took them all the way to market that way. When they were harvested for their meat as a uh, meat animal, we collected all of the viscera from the animals. In other words, all of the organs from the same slaughter plant I took the first stomach pictures from. The only organ we didn't collect was the brain. All of the other internal organs in the body cavity. We weighed all of the organs. We had the two licensed practicing veterinaries. Dr. Robinson did all the stomachs. Dr. Versteg worked on other body parts so we would have no differentiation in the determinations that they made. They did not know who was fed what. They didn't even know that there was a difference in the diet of these pigs. They just knew they had to do these complete autopsies. This was a completely blinded study. The people that did the work on the hogs, that did the mo daily monitoring and the recording of the different information, did not know who was fed what. The only person that knew what feed went where was the person who was responsible for putting the feed in the right feeder. This is a picture again of a normal hog stump. This is one that is severely inflamed. The statistical findings of the study. The GM fed pigs were 2.6 times more likely to have severe inflammations in their stomachs. Of this, the males were four times more likely and the females were 2.2 times more likely. The weight of the utera of the GM fed female was 25% abnormally heavy. In other words, it was 25% larger than the normal average weight of the non-GM fed female pigs. You remember I said we had problems with reproduction and digestion from 1998 coming forward. Did we find two body parts that are connected with reproduction and digestion as far as issues are concerned? 1998, we started seeing problems. 2013, in June, this study was published in a scientific journal. It's my understanding from all of the scientists that I'm privileged to work with that the typical time frame from the date you know the results of a scientific study until the day it's published is two to eight years, depending on the complexity and the different matters of the study. Well, that's 15 years from 1998 to 2013. I said it was circumstantial and coincidental. So we couldn't validate it according to the scientific process you have to follow to do a proper study. We had to weigh these pigs every week. When they were small, we picked them up, put them on the scale, looked at their number, wrote down their weight. When they got bigger, we made a simple maze. They went down the alley, they went through the simple maze. They got on the scale, write down the number and the weight, and away they go. The people that were weighing the pigs, again, did not know who was fed what. But the pigs were always in the same pen. This pen and this pen, they went through this process of getting weighed much faster. They could perform this simple task without any complication. This pen and this pen, not only did it take longer to weigh the pigs, as soon as you got them in somewhat of a confined area, they became irritable. They started fighting and biting and picking on one another. When they were back in their normal pen, 
the people that observed the animals on a daily basis saw this overall listlessness or lack of contentment in these pigs. I have a question. Between 1995 and today, have there been behavioral changes in the children and the young adults and even the adults in our country? Absolutely. We also saw an issue with eczema on some of the GM fed pigs. This is the simple maze. This gate swung around here. They had to walk down that straight alley and get on the scale. Now I'm going to shift gears to beef for a second. A friend of mine in Ohio does butchering on his farm. go in and plant and have a clean field. It was good for soil conservation in the beginning. As we progressed, we got the glyphosate tolerant crops in 1996, we increased the use of the herbicide. But about eight, maybe a few years <coughs> more ago, there was another use of this chemical introduced by the manufacturer. They said, you can use this as a desiccant or a ripening agent on your various non-GMO crops. Say your oats or your wheat or your rye or your barley is just about ready to harvest but it's not quite there and you don't trust the weather. Go out and spray this herbicide on there, kill that crop, it dries down in five to eight days and you can harvest it. Or if you're raising cantaloupe. You can do a couple pickings and you don't want to wait for the rest of them to ripen on the vine. Go in and spray them dead. You can come in five to eight days and harvest the rest. Or if you're raising sugar cane, you need to apply this herbicide eight weeks ahead of harvest. You'll knock all the leaves off that plant. Now the workers can come through and hand harvest those cane stalks like they typically do in Guatemala. No issues with burning the fields. Dr. Huber's been working in Guatemala with the cane plantations for a little over a year now because of the disease issues that they are experiencing in the crop. Since he started working with them, he educated them to the fact of the damage of glyphosate and what it does to the soil and the crop, and I'm going to share that with you. But the third trip he made down there, one of the men said to him, we are losing one in four of our cane field workers per year to renal kidney failure. Oh. Dr. Huber, being the outstanding epidemiologist that he is, started asking questions. He said, when did this happen? As they traced things back, the renal kidney failure problem to the field workers started happening the exact same year they started using the glyphosate herbicide as a desiccant on the cane crop. So what happens to that glyphosate residue when you spray it on a crop that's about ready to harvest? This is a schematic by Dr. Bob Kramer, a USDA research scientist at the University of Missouri. You put glyphosate on a weed or a genetically engineered crop or any plant for that matter, a minimum of 20% that hits the foliage of that weed is translocated through that plant into the soil. There are numerous, numerous scientific studies that are documented that glyphosate is a very strong chelator. 
A chelate is a Greek word meaning claw or to hold. If you chelate something, I'm chelating this finger, it is tied up. It don't come out. Glyphosate is an extremely effective chelator. It chelates calcium, magnesium, manganese, zinc, iron, copper, nickel, cobalt, boron, molybdenum, selenium, and potassium, potassium, and does not let them go. Wherever it's present, when the glyphosate residue is present in the soil, it chelates the mineral. When the glyphosate residue is present in the plant, it chelates the mineral. When the glyphosate residue is present in the grain, it chelates the mineral. In addition to being a broad spectrum chelator, glyphosate is an extremely effective biocide. In other words, it has an adverse effect on the biological community in the soil. Dr. Kramer has numerous studies that have documented the fact that when you use glyphosate herbicide, you are going to damage or completely wipe out a number of beneficial organisms in the soil. These beneficial organisms are the control mechanisms for many of the disease-causing or opportunistic organisms in the soil. As you get rid of the controls, the bad ones increase, plus, as a bonus, the glyphosate also acts as a food source for some of the opportunistics, so it not only increases it, but then it will also can increase the virulence of the opportunistic organisms that causes even more plant disease. The manufacturers of this product denied it for many years that it had any adverse effect on the biological community in the soil. But in 2010, we found a patent on the U.S. Patent Office website. You can go investigate this yourself. Patent number 777-1736. It's a patent that's registered to Monsanto, registering glyphosate as an antibiotic. You start to read this patent, and you will see the first thing on the top, it's used for parasite control. Well, a parasite is just a higher form of an organism. As you read down through this, you will start to recognize different organisms that it affects. At a tenth of a part per million, it is capable of wiping out the vast majority of beneficial organisms that human beings and animals need in their digestive tract to both digest the food, that they consume and control the opportunistic organisms that could be present. This is another study on glyphosate. They took a genetic, a, a conventional soybean line and the genetically engineered version of it. They grew them up in the greenhouse. They sprayed glyphosate at a half weight rate twice and full rate once on the genetically engineered variety. They measured the effect on the lignin content. It dropped it significantly which affects the capability of the plant to stand up. They measured the effect on the photosynthesis production capability of the plant or the manufacturing of sugars that the plant needs to do to grow and be healthy. They measured the production of the amino acid content. This is the center of the defense mechanism in a plant. A plant doesn't have a system like a mammal does. They have a defense mechanism. The production of the enzymes and the amino acids are the protection mechanism that keep that plant healthy, especially in the event of any disease. In essence, if a plant had an immune system, when you spray it with glyphosate, you could say you're going to give it a bad case of AIDS. The last thing they measured was the water use efficiency. It took more than twice as much water to raise the same amount of plant biomass when you had the genetically engineered soybean sprayed with glyphosate herbicide. Is water efficiency important in crop production? Is the lignin content in a crop important in crop production? We have a lot of windy days when we get rain in Iowa. 50 mile an hour wind came through that area the night before. The glyphosate resistant corn fell down the conventional stood up. This is a partial listing of the diseases that are scientifically document, documented to increase when you use glyphosate in the field where they're growing. Everything from apples, bananas, barley, beans, canola, all the way down to wheat. On wheat, 
if you use glyphosate one year out of the previous three years to planting wheat in your field, you will see an increase in head scab and take all and root blotch. All of those plant diseases have the potential to develop the growth of mold and mycotoxins in that field. What happens to the mycotoxins when you harvest the grain? This is a picture of cornfields in Iowa in 2010. As you can see, most of the cornfields are brown. There's one green cornfield. This picture was taken in the end of August. Corn should not be brown until the middle to the end of October unless we get an early frost. Because the of the continual use of glyphosate herbicide year after year after year, and the damage to the beneficial organisms and the increased virulence to the opportunistic organisms and the increased pressure of these organisms, you can't put enough fungicide on to keep it healthy. And this is actually a bacterial infection. How do you treat a bacterial infection in a corn crop? You can't. You cannot put an antibiotic on a cornfield. Goss wilt is the name of this disease. There's been two, two scientific studies conducted that verify that when you, that the, the only thing we had to do to manage Goss wilt in the olden days was to select a hybrid that had the natural resistance and tolerance to the disease. There's been two studies conducted. They took seven hybrids that had strong goss wilt resistance. They sprayed one set with water, one set with water in the disease, one set with water, the disease, and POEA, which is the surfactant that's put with glyphosate in Roundup herbicide. And they sprayed one set in this replicated trial with the, the water, the organism that causes the disease and the glyphosate. Five of the six, seven resistant hybrids succumbed to the disease when they used the organism and the surfactant, and six of the seven succumbed to the disease when the glyphosate in the organism was there. Neither one of those studies are published and they never will be. Because the people that conducted that study would commit fine natural suicide with their career as a crop PhD researcher if they published that study. Resistant weeds, 24 plus worldwide that are quote unquote resistant to glyphosate. I don't know if they're resistant or if they're just super weeds. This is a picture of the amaranth pigweed in the southeast U.S. As I said, I had the good privilege of working with farmers in the southeast U.S. starting in 2010. There's no herbicide has been applied to this field at this point in time. but when this weed gets over that tall, you don't put 32 ounces of glyphosate on it. You could put 128 ounces or one gallon on it and you won't touch it. When that weed gets over three inches tall, you can put eight different herbicides in the tank and go spray that would qualify to be used on a peanut or a cotton crop. You can't stop that weed. It used to be three foot tall when it was full grown. Now it's 10 to 12 feet tall. It used to have 100,000 seeds when it was three foot tall. Now it has four to 500,000 seeds. You know how the cotton and peanut farmers get ahead of that weed when they have it in their fields? They have the hand laborers come in and remove it. They do not cut it off. If they cut it off, it'll grow right back. They have to either pull them out or dig them up. And it's, they're spending as much as $150 per acre to have that single weed removed from their field. In Iowa, we have a first cousin to it. It's known as the amaranth pigweed. This is pictures from a customer's field I worked with the first time this past year. He sprayed that field three times with Roundup herbicide. He wouldn't even tell me how much he put on it. He couldn't kill it. If it has to compete with corn, it will. It'll get up there eight plus feet tall. There's none of the herbicides that we used to be able to control this weed with post-emerge work. Glyphosate residue, in 2010 and 11, Paul Capel and his team of U.S. Geological Survey scientists set up monitoring equipment in Iowa and Mississippi. They monitored the, amount, monitored the amount of glyphosate residue in the air, in the rain, and in the rivers throughout the growing season. They found significant levels of glyphosate in the air, in the rain, and in the rivers throughout the growing season. 
We have detected glyphosate residue in alfalfa, barley, corn, edible peas, soybeans, potatoes, and I could go on. The alfalfa was not genetically engineered alfalfa. The alfalfa was fertilized with manure from livestock that were fed a ration of grain that was grown in a glyphosate tolerant production system. There's virtually no manure that you can test that has been fed to an animal that's raised in that glyphosate production system that you won't find significant levels of glyphosate. On the poultry litter, it's typical to find two-thirds of a quart of glyphosate herbicide in three ton of manure. In 1994, the EPA said two parts per million per day per life would hurt no one. Last year, on the 1st of May, they increased the glyphosate residue tolerance levels in virtually every single grain and food and forage crop that they have a tolerance level for, as high as 40 parts per million in the grain and 400 parts per million in forage. Yeah, you may ask, why did they do this? Yeah, I know. They received a request from a company in St. Louis to increase the tolerance level. In 1997, it went from a tenth of a part per million in soy up to 20 parts per million. We routinely find five to ten parts per million of glyphosate residue in the soy products in our country and in Argentina. They did a random sampling last year at harvest time. They monitored, they sampled 11 samples of soybeans for glyphosate residue. Seven of the 11 had levels above the world standard of 20 parts per million. They had the highest levels at 90 parts per million. You might say, well, does this matter? <laughs> Oh my God. Sarah Laney is a French scientist who has done some es excellent research on genetically engineered crops and also glyphosate residue problems. At a half of a part per million of glyphosate residue, you will have complete infertility, killing both the sperm and the egg. At two tenths of a part per million of glyphosate residue, you will have endocrine disruption to the cell. Endocrine disruption to the cell to a fetus in the womb spells some type of birth defect. Endocrine disruption to a, a cell in an adult. You have cells that die and rejuvenate in your body every day. What do you call it when an endocrine disruptor gets in your system and now there's abnormal cell development and growth? Yeah. Dr. Andreas Carrasco in Argentina was consistently seeing birth defects to the babies that were being born to the mothers who lived immediately adjacent to the soybean fields that were being sprayed with glyphosate herbicide with an airplane. He conducted a scientific study on frog and chick embryos. He purposely exposed the embryos to varying levels of glyphosate residue. At 2.03 parts per million, he documented consistent birth defects in those frog and chick embryos, facial cranial disorders, some of them were missing eyes, some of them had cleft palates, and on and on. The babies, there's been a 447 percent increase in the birth defects in this area where these women live adjacent to these glyphosate tolerant soybeans that are being sprayed between 1998 and 2008. What's going on in Washington State? Last fall there was a report, late last summer, early fall, there was a report by the Washington State Health officials. They were stumped by the dramatic increase in the birth of the babies with encephalopathy, a terrible birth defect. It affects the brain. If the child is alive when it's born, it won't live more than a matter of hours. If they do a little investigating, they would find that for the last 15 plus years, the only herbicide that's been allowed to be used for weed control in the Yakima Valley River valley is glyphosate. Glyphosate again is a strong metal chelator. The tying up the calcium could affect teeth and bones. The iron will affect the blood. The manganese and zinc tie up will affect the liver and the kidney. The copper and magnesium deficiency would affect the brain. When the tissue in your brain and the conductivity goes backwards, what do we see? Dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Are those diseases increasing in our country? Oh yes. This is a picture of a stillborn baby calf, manganese deficiency. Dr. Art Dunham, a veterinarian in Northeast Iowa, he lives in a part of Iowa that traditionally there have always been excess manganese levels in the soil. They had to make sure they never put any additional manganese in the supplement for the livestock or they'd see manganese toxicity. 
Starting in 2004, remembering in 1996, we introduced the glyphosate tolerant crops. By 2004, there were manganese deficiencies manifesting themselves in all of the animals that his customers who were using the glyphosate technology were raising. One example is there's a healthy looking animal this morning, it's dead tonight. There were no clinical signs of ill health. He did a good job of the investigative epidemiological work to get to the bottom of it. He sent liver samples to Iowa State University and had them do a complete mineral analysis. Manganese levels were 10, 15, at best 20 percent of normal. When you don't have adequate manganese in the liver, the liver will not dis expel the toxins from the body. Dr. Nancy Swanson is a PhD researcher, retired from Washington State University and also retired from military service to our country. She did a, a review and an investigation and published this article about a year ago. She looked at the correlation between the introduction and the implementation of genetically engineered crops and the subsequent increase in glyphosate herbicides starting in 1996 and going through 2012. This is a summary of all of the diseases that she found significant increases with the CDC. I'm only going to highlight a few of these. If you want to access this full report, you can find it on the Moms Across America website. Glyphosate use and autism. We're starting in 1990. The red line is the increased use in the glyphosate between 1990 and 2009-2010 time period. The yellow bars is the increase in autism in our country in the same time period. This does not prove cause and effect. But the correlation factor is 98.5%. Anytime there's an increase in disease at that level and a correlation significantly applied, the CDC should be in full alert yeah. investigating this epidemic outbreak. And if you look at the Sam Sell and Seneff paper that was published last year that looks at all of the information in the scientific literature that documents all of the potential ill effects caused by glyphosate herbicide, you will find a connection to every one of these diseases I'm going to show you. In autism in the U.S., Dr. Sam Stephanie Seneff has been done, published numerous papers on this subject. In 2007, it was 1 in 150 children in our country with autism. By 2009, it's 1 in 100. By 2013, it's 1 in 50. And it's 1 in 29 for the boys at that point in time. By 2020, if this trend does not change, 1 in 2 children in our country oh will have God. autism. Diabetes, starting at 1980. The green line is the trend line. If the trend would continue from here forward and going forward, that's where we should be. 1996, the introduction of genetically engineered crops and the subsequent use of glyphosate. Again, not cause and effect, 98.18% correlation factor. Thyroid cancer, the trend line is the green line. Starting at 1975, there's where we should be. 1996, the introduction of genetically engineered crops and the subsequent increased use of glyphosate, 98.76% correlation factor. Now we're going to go to Germany for a minute. Dr. Monica Kruger is a veterinary pathologist at Leipzig University, has done outstanding work on documenting the ill effects of glyphosate in the digestive tract and the damage it does to the beneficial organisms in both chickens and cattle. In chickens, it'll wipe out three beneficial and kick E. coli into overdrive. In cattle, it wipes out three beneficial organisms and allows the Clostridium botulinum to go completely unchecked. When Clostridium botulinum goes unchecked, you have toxic co-infection or botulism. You might say, well, that wouldn't happen in our country. If we had the climate that they had, there would be a chance that would, we would see it at the epidemic level. They're seeing it in Germany. But I want to share with you a couple instances of what has happened in our country. Dr. Michael McNeil is a Ph.D. researcher from North Central Iowa, excellent crop consultant. 
He gives talks all over the country to farmers about these problems that we're continuing to see increase with genetically engineered crops and glyphosate herbicide. He was up in the New England states giving a talk. After the meeting, the one farmer that was a dairyman came up to him and he says, we're having cows drop dead periodically and the vets cannot figure out what's wrong. Would you come to my farm tomorrow and look at them? Dr. McNeil obliged. He went out. He looked at the, they were standing in the barn looking at the cattle. One of the cows walked up, took a drink out of the water fountain, walked away from the water fountain and dropped dead right in front of them. Dr. McNeil said the farmer started to cry. He didn't know what to do, he just stood there. The farmer then went on to explain that his grandson was in the hospital and he was failing rapidly. They had no idea what was wrong with the child. Dr. McNeil questioned him about the child's symptoms. Dr. McNeil was in the infectious disease department at Fort Detrick when he served our military in Beltsville, Maryland. He recognized that the child had botulism. He told that farmer, you get to that hospital and you tell him to test that child for botulism as soon as you can get there. Thank the good Lord, the test proved positive. They gave him the right probiotic and they saved the child's life. We're hearing of more cases where the milkers who are milking the cows where they sporadically see a cow drop dead just like I explained, the milkers are getting sick. It's happening in different parts of the United States. It's more frequent where there's a higher incidence and a longer time frame of the use of the glyphosate produced crops. I have a friend in Denmark. They're using glyphosate as a desiccant on all of the small grains. And he's got a neighbor that's in dairy. They can't get workers to come to the farm to work and milk the cows anymore because of the illness that the workers get when they're there. In our country, 10 to 20 percent of the babies that are succumbing to sudden infant death syndrome are testing positive for the Clostridium botulinum organism. In January of 2011, Dr. Huber sent a letter to Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack. It was a confidential letter alerting him to a problem that had been brought to Dr. Huber's attention by a researcher in production agriculture. It was at that time identified as a suspect agent in a fungal mycelium. Today we've referred to it as an abortogenic agent. The purpose of this letter was threefold. Number one, to alert the Secretary of Agriculture to this problem. Number two, an appeal for assistance. The USDA has the full manpower, personnel, and equipment to come in and investigate an issue like this and get to the bottom of it overnight. They failed to want to do that. They declined. The other purpose of the letter was to urge the secretary not to deregulate Roundup Ready alfalfa and Roundup Ready sugar beets because of the tremendous incidence and frequency of this problem causing spontaneous abortions in beef and dairy cattle and hogs and chickens and horses and sheep and goats. It will kill a fertilized chick embryo in 24 hours and we also know that it has been found to be present where women have miscarried. That letter that Dr. Huber sent to the Secretary of Agriculture was released into the public without Dr. Huber's knowledge or consent. As a result of it, it went around the world in a very short time. Not long after that, the Chinese sent an email, the scientists in China sent an email to Dr. Huber. They had taken some Roundup Ready soybeans they imported from the United States, sprouted them, and grew them up. When they got to the V3 stage, they cut the leaf on the soybean, they took the sap out of the leaf and they put it on a slide and they put it under an electron microscope and magnified it up to 40,000 power. They sent Dr. Huber slides that were just about identical to the pictures I showed you earlier. What do you see in this picture? That's a combine harvesting genetically engineered corn that's been sprayed with glyphosate herbicide we are seeing a tremendous increase in not only the amount of dust coming off of the combine harvesting either the soybeans or the corn that are genetically modified and sprayed with either Liberty or glyphosate or Roundup, 
but also the color of the dust has changed. It's blacker. A gentleman noticed this. He farms with his father and his brother. His father had Roundup Ready corn. He thought, I'm going to do a little test. He cleaned off a spot on the feeder house on the combine first thing in the morning when they were going to harvest the Roundup Ready corn. At the end of the day, he went back with the bag. He collected a sample of that dust, marked it as Roundup Ready corn dust. Then they got to his brother's Liberty Link corn field. He did the same thing. He cleaned off the combine collected a dust sample at the end of the day, marked it Liberty Link corn dust. He custom feeds hogs. He has a confinement building. He custom feeds for an integrator. He saw a lot of dust in the hog confinement building, so he took a sample of that dust and identified it hog dust. He sent all of these dust samples to Midwest Labs in Omaha for a mold count and ID. They measure it in CFUs per gram, colonization forming unit. It's kind of like Measuring rain, you have to have a mechanism how to measure it. The hog dust. When they sent the results back, by the way, they said, warning, anybody working in an environment where there's over a thousand CFUs per gram should have a protective breathing device on, similar to this one. This is a 95 grain simple dust mask, as you can see, and it was worn when a farmer was scooping out a grain bin. I advise all farmers to wear one of these when they're around any grain, GMO or not nowadays, because of the increase of mold and mycotoxins caused by the glyphosate. But back to this, 1,000 CFUs per gram, you should have a mask on. 14,000 CFUs per gram in the hog dust. 1,000 is Aspergillus niger, 10,000 is Aspergillus species, 3,000 is penicillin. Liberty Link corn dust, 7,200,000, 700,000 Aspergillus species and 200,000 penicillin. Roundup Ready corn dust, mold count and ID, 15,600,000, it's all Aspergillus species. Oh my God. You may wonder why I bring this up. <laughs> the number one reason is I advise every farmer that's around grain to wear a protective breathing device. What's the danger of a mold or mycotoxin entering your system? illness and disease. Well the thing that we have noticed and it depends on the weather that we have during the growing season. When harvest comes there's combines running everywhere in Iowa. Whether you live next to a field or not doesn't matter if the wind blows. And the frequency and the incidence of the respiratory ailments of the people that live in the small towns that are adjacent to these fields, I've tried to get the one university to do a research study on this. First of all, let's get a bunch of these dust samples and compare them and collect them. I've not been successful in getting them interested. If I raise enough money at some point in time for research, I plan to do that on my own or with the other scientists that will collaborate with it, but we need the research funds. The university has the equipment to do the test, but we can't get them interested. What about the health of the people that live in the small rural towns? What about the farmers that scoop the grain bin out and end up in the hospital with pneumonia because they didn't wear a dust mask? This is an interactive slide. I want you to participate with me in this. Do you recognize any of the names in the center of the <laughs> Have you ever seen a commercial on TV or in print that says, if you can't afford your medication costs, contact <laughs> us. We have a program to assist you. Commercial sponsored by AstraZeneca. Have you ever heard of atrazine? Yes. One of the oldest herbicides used in corn production in our country made by AstraZeneca Syngenta, who is also the number four producer of genetically engineered crops in the world. When you see or hear bear, what do you think of? Aspen. Have you ever heard of bear crop science, the makers of Aztec insecticide, Liberty herbicide, and genetically engineered crops? When you see or hear Pfizer Pharmacia up, John, what do you think of? This company at one time was the sole holding company of Monsanto. They're no longer directly connected, but somewhat. So we've established the fact that all of these companies are in the chemical and pharmaceutical business. 
We're going to start with chemical. I would like you to give me one word that you might use to describe a chemical that kills a weed or an insect, and you're describing this chemical to a five-year-old child. What one word might you use? Poison. Okay, we're using poison to raise crops. What do we raise crops for? Cereal and grain. If there were to be any residual effect in the use of this poison to raise a crop, do you think it would be positive or negative? If there's a negative effect of using the poison on the crop that might affect the grain, what do we feed most of the grain to? If that negative effect affects the grain and the, you feed it to the livestock and the livestock don't feel good, who might you call? When he comes, what might he suggest you give them to make them feel better? Anybody. What if you would like to lower your cost of production and make your animals grow faster, what might you give them? Hormones. What do we raise livestock for? to protect the child you're going to bring into the world. Dr. Art Dunham is author, or daughter, excuse me, is the author of this book. Very interesting story of how she witnessed through the eyes of the daughter of a veterinary the divergence in production agriculture and how there became two roads. America's two-headed pig. This is the last one, The Unhealthy Truth. It's by Robin O'Brien, the story of a mother of four children that watched one of her children have an anaphylactic re allergic reaction to food she put on the breakfast table for her children on Saturday morning. Why should food be harmful to children? The TPP, if you're not familiar with this, I'm going to be very brief about it. It's a proposed trade agreement that if initiated, it's, first of all, it's being ne negotiated in secret by the man at the head of our country and a few of his helpers. If it is implemented, we will, in essence, based on the limited bit of information that has been leaked out through various sources, we will hand over complete sovereignty to rule and govern our nature, nation to multinational corporations that will designate who runs the World Tribunal Court that will decide any disputes that they see fit to bring. The country won't have the right to protect its citizens, the state won't have the right, the county won't have the right, the city won't have the right. It'll all be suspect to challenges from this World Tribunal Court. If you don't think this is a good idea, there is a phone number in Washington, D.C. that you could call. It's the switchboard for the congressmen and the senators. You can call this number, and I'll give it to you if you're ready to write it down. If you would like, 202-224-3100. If you think this idea is a bad idea, you might want to call that number. If you think it's a good idea, don't call. <laughs> I'd like to end this on a bit of a lighter note and a positive note. First, the lighter note. We received this picture from Gilbert Hotstetler. He, he had ears of corn in the warehouse. He had non-GMO ears of corn in the sack on the right and GMO ears of corn in the sack on the left, sitting side by side in the warehouse. You can see which one the mice preferred. I showed this picture in a presentation in Ohio, and a gentleman did his own experiment. He took a conventional ear of corn and put it on a nail on the tree, and he took a genetically engineered ears of, ear of corn and put it on another nail on the tree, and took this picture nine months later. Now I have a question. 
what do the mice and the squirrels know that the scientists don't? <laughs> wow. In the drought in 2012, we had as extreme a drought as we've experienced since 1998. This is a gravel road separating these two corn fields. This field has a history of 15 plus years of genetically engineered crops, a glyphosate herbicide. This was a genetically engineered crop, sprayed with glyphosate herbicide that year. This is a field that has a history of non-GMO crops exclusively and biological crop production. There can only be one explanation for why this corn was the yield that was settled with federal crop was 109 bushels per acre, and the appraised yield on this before it was chopped for silage was 28 bushels per acre, and that reason is obviously a brain, but more on that side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone is inclined in any way to want to contribute to research, we would appreciate any donation you would want to make. This is not a mandatory request in any way, shape, or form, but if I don't mention it to you, nothing will happen. The research dollars that should be applied to addressing the issues and the concerns and the problems that we're seeing in our country are all captive by the sources that are in control of what's going on in crop production. This is a personal request. This lovely young lady, I've not known that long, but she became a quick friend in a very short time. I worked on a special project with her with a delegation from China. She was our interpreter. She's an associate professor at North Cal Poly Tech University in California. She's a PhD. She was diagnosed with stomach cancer. I would ask that you would pray for her going forward and for the best for her. And I also found that my sister found out three, four, five days ago that my sister was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I'd ask your prayers for her as well. The pollen drift in a seed crop is financial devastation for the feed, seed producer who has to raise the non-GMO seed, whether it's organic or non-GMO, is irrelevant. If it's certified non-GMO, it has to be pure seed. And why the courts got tipped upside down on this, I'll never understand. I compare it to two side-by-side -side pastures. You have a man with an outstanding purebred cattle herd on one side of the fence. That's the conventional, non-GMO. Now you have a commercial herd across the fence. The commercial breeder has a cur bull. The cur bull gets in the field with the purebred cattle and does his thing. And subsequently, that purebred breeder loses a good opportunity for a calf that year. He can hold the man that owns the cur bull completely liable for the financial damages that happen to him. I don't know why the courts had their head somewhere that shouldn't have been in the decision they made on this, but it's absolutely wrong. The liability should be on the entity that produce, produces the curb bull and lets them run around. As far as the commercial grain production, we have things that we're doing, for example, in corn that we can mitigate and minimize the contamination. We always harvest our border rows separate. That's housed separate as far as in a different bin. We clean out the harvest equipment in between. We'll test that. If it's under the tolerance level that's allowable for the non-GMO, then it goes through. If it's not, it gets dumped in town. The thing that we don't have to be concerned about, per se, on the, the minimal drift that you're going to have, there's no such thing as 100% non-GMO in the commercial arena where you have that situation across the road or across the fence. 60 feet is our typical buffer. When we have a nutrient management program that we're raising this crop with biological diversity in the soil and nutrient density in the crop, there's so much good in that grain going into that supply for that animal that that little bit of contamination will be mitigated. Our immune systems, as mammals have, just like we have, are designed to protect us from this foreign invader. 
It's just when you have the bulk of the supply of that foreign invader in the food supply in a constant fashion. There's three things, as I see it, that are contributing to the deterioration of health in mammals in our country, livestock and people. Farmers for many years have been paid for bulk. The more you grow, the better. It doesn't matter if it's hollow calories that's being consumed and there's no nutrient density in that crop. And you can go and look at all of the records and see how the macro and micronutrient levels have deteriorated in the crop production in our country for the last how many years. Well, that doesn't happen when you pay attention to raising this crop in a biological nutrient-dense management program. You see increased nutrient levels, not decreased. So, if you're consuming bulk, the mass-produced stuff that's on the store in the grocery, stores, grocery shelves, you have the hollow calories that don't support the immune system, so it's not strong. Now you throw in the foreign protein aspect of all the different sources. Not only is the immune system not strong, it's now challenged. Then you put in the straw that breaks the camel's back, the environmental toxin, whether it's a heavy metal in a vaccine, or it's a chemical contaminant in the water or the food supply, or it's a mycotoxin, why do we see things implode? It's that simple. If you're eating as nutrient-dense of food as you possibly can, your immune system, the good Lord designed it to work to protect us. Thank you, Howard. Wow. Yeah.